give me a thumbs up when it's recording. Okay, so I'm delighted to be able to uh, welcome Sinanu Thane Lemelson uh, to Yale today. Uh, Dr. Thane Lemelson is also is currently a lecturer in the Department of Anthropology at the University of California, Los Angeles, where she teaches undergraduate classes on the anthropology of Burma, Myanmar, political imprisonment, and social movements and controlling processes. That last course is a shout out to a course that we both took at different times at UC Berkeley when we were undergraduates with our favorite professor, Laura Nader. So I just had to make a shout out to Laura Nader. Um, she has a long track record of research in Myanmar going back to 2008, and is the author of numerous important articles, both on psychocultural approaches to anthropology and the general political situation. Some notable recent highlights include uh, White Shirts and Sacred Amulets, this paper that we're going to hear today, which is just coming out in ethos right now as we speak, um, Politicide in the Myanmar Coup in Anthropology Today in 2021, Fear and Silence in Burma and Indonesia, Comparing Two National Tragedies and Two Individual Outcomes of Trauma, co-authored with Robert Lemelson in Interdisciplinary Handbook of Trauma, as well as Grooming and Cultural Socialization, a Mixed Method Study of Caregiving Practices in Burma and the United States, International Journal of Psychology in 2015. As you can see, a really wide range of very impressive and interesting scholarly contributions, not only to Myanmar, but to the study of psychocultural anthropology. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Thane Lemelson for today's talk, White Shirts as Sacred Amulets. Thank you so much, um, Eric, for that very thoughtful um, introduction. Thank you for inviting me here. Uh, thank you also to the Council on Southeast Asian Studies and also Francis, who sent me the email uh, to invite me to uh, uh, join you guys for your brown bag today. Um, so, um, so I actually um, always like to start my, how do you make it go forward? Okay, there it is. Um, so I just always like to start my talks uh, reminding people that it's actually been over two years, almost three years uh, since uh, Myanmar or Burma uh, had, um, had yet another military coup in 2021. Um, and I always tell people to understand the 2021 coup, you really have to understand going forward is okay. Uh, you really have to understand what happened in the 2015 election. This was when the National League for Democracy, which was the traditional resistance movement or the opposition uh, to the military junta, won a landslide victory um, against the military pact uh, uh, political party, the USDP. Um, and I was there, this was part of my field work at the time, um, and the reaction on the part um, of the civilians at the time after 30 years of engaging in this nonviolent movement for democracy was just complete um, elation. Um, and um, just to give you a sense of some of the scale of some of these rallies uh, that were going on at the time. So if you look at this, if you look at the sea of red, that space, that little square you see up there is the stage. Mm -hmm and everything else are the supporters who came up uh, for the National League for Democracy um, and for the democracy movement in Burma. Um, and just to give you uh, some background on my research and what I'm gonna talk about today. So the Burmese democracy movement began in 1988. Uh, it was started largely by uh, university students in the urban center of Yangon in Burma. Um, and for many of these activists, uh, what happened in 2015 in terms of the democratically elected elections was something that they had uh, worked for for almost three decades. Uh, many had been imprisoned along the way, sometimes for decades. Uh, many had lost friends and family. Uh, they had uh, also been, both them and their families had also been subjected to political violence, torture, um, harassment, and dehumanization. Uh, and just to give you um, a little bit of background on what happened in 1988 when the movement first began, this was when sort of uh, the nationwide protests and millions of demonstrators came out onto the streets. It was sort of like their Arab Spring. Uh, the, the military ended up committing massacres um, in August and September of that year. Uh, there's no body counts and no proper uh, you know, accounting done of the lives that were lost. Uh, but it's um, estimated that it's, it's upwards of 10,000 just within August and September of that year. Um, in the aftermath 
1988. Uh, there was the prohibition of public meeting. Uh, so no more than five people could legally gather at a time. There was complete and total censorship. Uh, this particularly pertained to the democracy movement. So images of its leaders like Aung San Suu Kyi or Minko Nai were expressly forbidden. You could be arrested yourself if you had a picture of Minko Nai or Aung San Suu Kyi. Uh, no freedom of movement. There was a household registry. A vast neighborhood surveillance network was set up with local spies who would inform on each other in the neighborhoods. The universities and schools where the democracy movement and the activists began organizing would be closed for years at a time. Time. There was the manipulation of cultural narratives um, and forced labor yeah, in both the urban and rural areas. In Yangon, up until the transition in 2010, uh, each household had to contribute at least one able-bodied uh, male uh, to various types of uh, road building and infrastructure projects to the government as a volunteer. Um, there was also the annulment of another set of democratic elections uh, in 1990 that the NLD had also won. Um, around this time, around 400 elected officials of uh, government were systematically rounded up, interrogated, tortured, and imprisoned, uh, sometimes for up to uh, a couple of decades. Um, NLD offices were also raided. Uh, seized and shut down. Uh, there was forced relocations, land seizures, dispossession. Um, and um, I, I would estimate that around, there was probably around at least half a million urban residents in Yangon between 1988 and 1990 that were forcefully removed, largely those neighborhoods and communities that came out in full force during 1988. This is not happening in the peripheral areas of Burma. It's not happening in Rakhine State to Rohingya communities. This is happening right in the former capital in Yangon. Half a million forcefully relocated and displaced. Um, there were, um, once again, no solid figures. I estimate that there's probably upwards of 100,000 in prison. I think that's probably a low number uh, between 1988 and 2010. And of course, the number of rules, social sanctions, and other mechanisms that monitored, uh, surveillance, um, and also kept former political prisoners from entering the educational system or uh, certain professions such as law and education. Um, inside the prisons, political prisoners were denied adequate food, clean water, sanitation, medical care. They were used also as forced labor. Uh, there was deep torture and dehumanization. Uh, some of the activists that I've worked with, for example, were kept in uh, cells meant for military dogs for months at a time. Uh, many were forced to wear chains around their feet continuously uh, for several months at a time. Uh, female prisoners that I work with uh, were forced to wear sarong stained with their own menstrual blood. Sometimes they would be taken and brought to, in front of generals uh, during court trials with the stains still on their sarongs in order to humiliate them. Um, and an unknown number perished from the violence, disease, um, and inhumane conditions inside the prisons. <laughs> so one of the main questions uh, that I'll ask today is really in the face of 27 years of state-sponsored oppression, persecution, and domination, how do you draw cl cl uh, crowds like this? Why are all these? Why were all these people still coming out in 2015 after those many decades of violence and oppression? Um, so one of the main questions I ask in my research is how social social movements uh, sustain themselves across time. Um, how they and the communities and the, and the activists who participate in them remain resilient um, over time. Um, so the existing literature um, on the democracy movement in Burma um, is largely uh, consists of four transnational discourses. It's dominated by four uh, overarching frameworks. Uh, that's the framework of human rights, humanitarianism or human, humanitarian aid, the public health model of trauma, and a combination of sort of the literature on democratization and neoliberalism, how, you know, what progress Burma is making um, in terms of that. Um, and popular media representations um, of the democracy movement and its community of political prisoners um, have vacillated between extreme representations, either representing uh, these activists as either noble or savage, 
um, as victims or perpetrators, um, as being courageous or cowardly, as being human rights heroes or human rights villains, um, and my favorite as being either saints or pariahs uh, and monsters. And the academic history of Burma, for those of you who are familiar with it, uh, from 1962 uh, to 2015, certainly, but arguably until the present day, has largely been a narrative and a history of the military and its many conflicts. There has been an emphasis in the academic discourse on the subjectivity of military actors, including their motivations, their sense of historical agency, their power, their control, their dominance, and their psychocultural qualities. So what I try to do, just to give you a sense of sort of the broader research agenda that I have, um, is to really shift focus away from the historical agency and subjectivity of the military, uh, to move away from relying solely on transnational discourses like trauma and human rights. Um, and I try to uh, center my analysis on the culture, psychology, and most importantly, the subjectivity of the political prisoners themselves. Um, and as a, I, I'm a psychological anthropologist, um, and, and I employ methods such as person-centered interviewing, um, and the unit of analysis that I use um, is personal experience, especially um, in relation to sort of embodied um, experiences uh, that individuals have and mundane practice. So this is um, also part of sort of a, a, a broader ethnographic endeavor. Uh, this was a six-year multi-sided ethnography with uh, former political prisoners um, and their families, uh, both in Burma um, and in the Burmese diaspora between 2013 and 2019, and the times when I wasn't actually continuously in Burma, um, as well as to the present day since the coup, um, I would interact with these communities online and continue my um, you know, ethnography virtually. Um, some of the longer term research goals of this broader ethnographic endeavor um, is to write a decentered, decolonized, decolonialized, demilitarized historiography of the Burmese democracy movement. Uh, as I said, to move away from relying solely on transnational discourses and as an anthropologist to really focus in on indigenous frames and epistemologies, um, as well as to write an account of how communities across Burma uh, produce power and created well being, as I said, through mundane practice um, under successive military regimes. Um, these are just some um, shots from my field work uh, with some of the community um, members. Um, as I said, I mostly um, engage in sort of ethnographic observations, person centered <laughs> interviews. I interviewed probably in excess of 100, um, over 100 political uh, prisoners, their families, supporters. Um, I also participated in their um, in their daily life, uh, so I would show up to the more sort of public events like rallies, uh, community meetings that they would hold, religious ceremonies, funerals, weddings. Uh, but I also uh, hung out with them a lot, just at, in their homes over dinner. Uh, I accompanied them on medical visits um, and participated. Uh, in the community and try to help support them through various forms of crisis, such as uh, during the cases of mass arrest, which actually happened quite a lot. Um, I also collected a lot of visual and audio data, probably about over 500 hours of video footage on this community. Uh, but more than anything, what I like to tell people is I made an existential commitment uh, to this community and certainly to the families that I work closely with, that I maintain to this day. So the social movement community um, of the democracy movement um, is not bounded by territory. They didn't reside in a single village. Uh, they, they were found in large urban centers in small cities, uh, villages and IDP camps. Um, and as part of the, the Burmese diaspora, um, I estimate uh, that there's probably about 100,000 in the core community all across Burma and its diaspora. In Yangon, where I conducted most of my field work, I would say there's probably a few thousand community members who had continuous face-to-face -face and physical contact with one another. Um, and this community inside of Burma connected with the diaspora through social media um, and other internet technologies. Um, the social movement community of the democracy movement is also ethnically, religiously, ideologically, and socioeconomically diverse. Uh, so in terms of ethnicity, 
uh, based on my snowball sample, uh, the dissidents that I worked with were Burmese, Chin, Gayin, Kachin, Burman of South Asian descent. They were Rohingya, Shan, Chinese, Myai, Rakhine. This is not an exhaustive list. There are many of mixed heritage. Um, in terms of religion, there are Buddhists, Christians, Muslims, uh, some who are really into Nat and spirit cults. Um, the vast majority of the dissidents that I worked with were left-leaning secular intellectuals and artists. So given this great diversity in terms of these activists, given that they didn't reside in a single sort of geographical location, uh, what really binds them together? What makes them a community? So what binds them together um, is shared suffering um, and shared meaning about the nature of that suffering. Um, I won't get to talk about it as much today, but in, in my other talks and what I'm writing a book on right now um, is sort of this foundational moral concept, a nitna, uh, sacrifice in Burmese, that really is sort of the, the broader meaning system and the foundational moral relational concept uh, that really binds this community together. Um, and it is the valorization of sacrifice, particularly bodily sacrifice, that places the political prisoner or what they colloquially call themselves as the Nanjin, which is short for Nangaye Ejinda, means political prisoner in Burmese. Uh, the, the valorization of sacrifice is really what places the political prisoner, the Nanjin, as the core of the social movement community and the fulcrum and the pivot around which everything else uh, revolves and, and functions. Um, so what I'll talk about today um, is how the former political prisoner community, these Nanjin, gather in something called the Nangayi Bues, which are the Burmese political festivals. Um, and the Nangayi Bues are opportunities for former political prisoners um, to really overturn historical patterns of dominance uh, by the military uh, through overlapping semiotic modalities that are expressed through dress, compartment, affect, and choreography. Uh, it's an opportunity for them to refashion uh, narratives about themselves, the violence that they suffered, um, as well as the world around them. And it's also a, a way for them to experience rejuvenation. So um, the Nagaye Bue, um, is really the sort of subgenre uh, of the Burmese square, uh, which is most typically uh, Buddhist um, in orientation. Also, there's many other like Nat and spirit quiz in Burma too. Um, and like the Buddhist square, the Nangaye Bue possesses distinct structured and unstructured elements. Um, there's you know a number of changes in sort of work and social routines uh, leading up to the day of the festival, uh, like any other. Uh, collective gathering and ritual. It possesses implicit and explicit goals. It has a distinct sort of aesthetic, temporal, and experiential quality. Um, and it's also where uh, sort of the more distal aspects of practice, uh, you know, around historically contingent epistemological and cosmological frameworks intersect with more proximal mechanisms of bodily discipline, internalized comportments, and rehearsed dreams. And the Naiga Yepue, its structure, um, its organization, its practice um, is also transmitted uh, intergenerationally uh, by the activists. Um, so unlike the Buddhist Bue, the Naiga Yepue is obviously, the political festival is obviously has a distinct political theme. Uh, political oratory usually replaces the religious sermon uh, with the charismatic activists stepping in almost as the bhikkhu or the monk. Um, and um, I want to emphasize that throughout the talk, I'm going to be really talking about the Nanya Yebwe, um, more in this category of it being part of, of um, the political sacred. And the political sacred is really this sort of diffuse conceptual space where aspects of politics are under understood through partially religious forms and modalities. Right. So it's not either explicitly political or religious as we would understand it. Um, and one important point that I will make um, is that it allows both non-Buddhists and Buddhists to participate in mutual enactments with one another um, as brothers and sisters in the movement. Um, and in Yangon, where I worked, there was probably 
anywhere from two to a dozen quiz every week. A large part of my field work was like, especially on a weekend, was like shuttling back and forth between these different festivals that they would have um, and, you know, constantly um, sort of being engaged either in helping them prepare for a festival or uh, likewise attending them. So as, as Eric uh, pointed out, this is, uh, you know, this part of this research is out now in Ethos as, a, as an article and you can read more about it. Uh, what I'm gonna be focusing on, there's many aspects of the Nangayipwe in terms of practice that I can um, uh, focus on. Um, I'm gonna be focusing in particular today on the white shirts known as the Legro Amy, uh, a Pew Legro Amy of the ADA generation, which is an activist group. Um, and I'm going to be specifically focusing on sort of bodily adornment um, and dress, specifically the, the meaning of these white shirts um, as part of within the context, the local context, the Nanyayipwe. So some of the um, theoretical and sort of conceptual tensions, but also sort of the dialogical kind of possibilities and relationships that I really had to contemplate um, in studying the democracy movement, uh, but in particular, uh, the political festivals in Nagaye and these white shirts that the ADA generation would wear is really this sort of tension and this dialogical relationship between on the one hand, uh, their desire for, for what I said, a nitna, for sacrifice to selflessness and sacrificial action, but at the same time also um, engaging in self-protection, self-care, self-creation, and occasionally uh, or often self-adulation, right, which are all sort of important human motives uh, that we all have. Um, and so the idea of refashioning the self, right, um, and asserting personal agency um, in the aftermath of trauma and violence can be really fraught um, in Buddhist societies uh, like Burma uh, because of the doctrine of anatta, which is the doctrine of not-self. It is essentially, it's a Buddhist doctrine that essentially states that the existence um, of an incorporeal soul is sort of this imaginary false belief um, and focusing on the self is associated with defilement and impurities. <clears throat> Hence, of course, the valorization of selfless sacrifice. So Foucault, uh, this is, of course, this doctrine of anatta, this focus, this valorization of selflessness is, of course, very different uh, from Foucault's observations about uh, Greco-Roman and Christian tradition and texts, especially during antiquity, uh, that actually pre were uh, preoccupied, uh, were, that were actually preoccupied with knowing um, and caring for the self. Um, and uh, he pointed out that two principles of antiquity were actually, in the, at least amongst the uh, Greeks and Romans and early Christian texts, was to take care of yourself and also uh, to know thyself. Um, and Foucault uh, came up with the concept of uh, sort of these technologies of the self, which he did not define as, uh, you know, those aspects um, of social life um, and um, repertoires of action, uh, that actually permit individuals to affect by their own means or with the help of others um, a certain number of operation on their own bodies and souls, thoughts, conduct, and ways of being um, so as to transform themselves in order to attain a certain state of happiness, purity, wisdom, um, perfection, um, or immor immortality. So really one of the questions I'm going to pose um, when, in looking at these white shirts um, and the, the political um, festivals is really how technologies of the self per Foucault are crafted um, in the Burmese ontological, epistemological, cosmological, political, uh, historical, and of course cultural context. And once again, influence, this context is influenced deeply by Theravadan Buddhism, uh, but there's also other syncretic uh, beliefs and elements in there. Um, and it's part of this, that's what I keep describing as this sort of diffuse conceptual space, the, the space of the political secret. So I'm gonna do kind of like a classic uh, anthropology, kind of like do this like analysis where I do kind of like uh, really contextualize the ADA generation of white shirts through looking, by looking at these sort of multiple layers of symbolic and interpretive meanings. Uh, that they have. 
um, I'm going to look at um, sort of what I describe as sort of more the pre-Buddhist, the ontological and cosmological. Um, I'm going to look at the Buddhist, which is the religious, ontological and cosmological after the arrival of Buddhism, uh, the political, historical, as well as personal meanings. Uh, including experiences of personal forms of violence that they suffered in their prison. And hopefully uh, I'll also get, talk, get to talk a little bit about the private and public. And I'm gonna go through this all really, really quickly. Um, so you don't have to worry about me talking forever. Um, so in terms of bodily adornment, because that's what these white shirts are, these ritual attires that they wear. Um, in terms of bodily adornment, uh, practices and beliefs about bodily adornment, um, preceded the arrival of Theravadan Buddhism into the region, um, including practices such as tattooing, um, amulets, um, and various types of ceremonial garments. Um, and also, and although, you know, um, sort of these traditions of tattooing and various types of, um, uh, you know, donning ceremonial uh, garments sort of differed uh, according to tribe, ethnicity, and local context, the meaning of it differed. Uh, some common themes that really cut across many historical, local, and cultural contexts was the ability of bodily adornment, including ritual attire, including tattooing, to both increase ontological security, as well as the spiritual potency or the power and charisma of whoever's donning that tattoo or amulet uh, or attire. Um, in terms of tattoos, for example, um, they were believed and are believed to have an um, apotropaic function. Uh, that, that is, they, that it's believed that they offer protection against illness, ward off evil spirits, um, and guard against uh, all manners of misfortune, right? Um, tattooing is um, common and it has really taken off actually after this 2021 coup. You can Google it online and see all the, the tattoos that are emerging, a lot of it with images of Aung San Suu Kyi and the democracy movement. Um, common images that are displayed on tattoos are um, sort of different types of animals and spirit beings, um, as well as uh, both mythical and actual animals that, that symbolize the resistance movement. Um, horoscopes, Buddhist sutras, um, and also images of the Buddha are common types of tattoos. And in Burma, um, as is true of Thailand and other parts of Southeast Asia, individuals also don uh, lepwe or amulets uh, to minif minimize their sense of vulnerability. Um, and common types of amulets, um, as is true of other types of Southeast, uh, other parts of Southeast Asia, like Cambodia, um, is typically just like strings that have been blessed uh, by a monk or tied around the wrist or the neck. Uh, sometimes, occasionally, um, you know, there'll be effigies depicting various types of um, you know, gnats or spirit animals or, or, or the Buddha. <coughs> so there's a long history and a long colonial history um, of this type of bodily adornment and its relationship to ontological security, uh, increasing ontological security. Uh, there was a group of soldiers, for example, during the colonial period known as the invulnerables, uh, who actually uh, had uh, placed the amulets, the gold and silver amulets under their skin uh, during the first Anglo-Burmese war. And they thought that it, it, it made them invincible against the British soldiers and the, and the bullets of the British. Uh, likewise, uh, during the Sen rebellion, uh, the, um, which, which was in the 1930s, the, uh, those who followed uh, Seiya Sen brandished uh, tattoos of gallons, which were likewise thought to make them invisible, uh, invincible um, and, and to guard them against the bullets um, of, the, um, of the British soldiers. Um, in terms of the religious meanings in the Buddhist uh, sort of universe, uh, monastic robes and really the donning of new robes as well as the, the disrobing or taking off robes. Um, it signals transition into new identities um, and social roles. Uh, so the Shimpyu ceremony that, or the novitiation ceremony for young, uh, young boys and most, uh, most Buddhist uh, male Buddhists in Burma go through uh, the Shimpyu ceremony, the novitiation ceremony. Um, it, it really marks the entry um, of young boys into the Sangha, into the monastic order for a brief period of time, and also signals uh, this very new ontological reality where strict boundaries 
are, are guarded between the initiated and uninitiated. Um, monastic robes, just like amulets and tattoos, are also thought to possess sacred and, and magical qualities. They're thought to offer protection from witches, ghosts, demons, um, and malevolent spirits. Uh, Buddhist morality, uh, or tila um, in Burmese, is imagined to be this metaphorical protective cloak in which the monk is supposed to remain wrapped, a cloak of decorum, that's what it's described as. Um, and many don't know this, but because the saffron robes are um, sort of the hallmark of Theravada Buddhism in Southeast Asia, but actually right before uh, young boys go into the novitiation ceremony, they're donned, uh, but when they're neither a monk or, um, or a lay person, uh, they're actually uh, donned in white robes for a brief period of time. Um, and during this time, they're called poti uh, with and Sometimes, and some remain donned in the white robes for quite a while. They live in the monasteries and assist the monks, and they only observe a, a subset of the precepts. So there's also historical and political meaning to the white shirts and white garments. Uh, the white shirts of the ADA generation certainly has historical continuity with the colonial era penny jacket. Uh, and um, you know, during this time, uh, when the anti-colonial resistance was, was getting going, uh, the, the donning of this white penny jacket uh, signaled anti-colonial resistance. If you saw someone on the street and they're wearing a white penny jacket, it means that they were against uh, colonialism. Um, the white penny jacket and later the white shirt also came to be associated uh, with student leaders, the Zhang Dao Gangzhao. Um, and in 1988, these student activists that organized the 1988 uh, demonstrations uh, began consciously wearing white shirts to identify with the lineage um, of the colonial era resistance, uh, especially General, someone in General Aung San, who's actually Aung San Suu Kyi's father. So there's yet another <coughs> layer, a very personal layer, a historical layer um, of meaning attached uh, to the white garments the white shirts of the ADA generation. Uh, from 1988 to 2007, uh, prison uniforms themselves were white. Um, and the donning of these white prison uniforms signaled for political prisoners uh, the entry into new forms of bodily subjugation, uh, symbolic as well as actual nakedness, um, and all manners of human misery torture and bodily degradations that they suffered in their prisons. Um, so when uh, political prisoners in Burma are interrogated and tortured, all their clothing is typically removed. Um, even after they have gotten through the interrogation and moved through the torture chambers, uh, the Nanjin or the political prisoners remain in various states of bodily exposure. Um, one of my main uh, participants in my ethnography, for example, told me that he only actually had one set of clothing for the first six months of his illegal detainment. Uh, one of his prison, prison comrades would occasionally loan him uh, garments as well. But essentially, um, you know, he, he wore what were amounted to sort of rags um, during his first six months of imprisonment. Um, and this was common. Um, in terms of sort of bodily vulnerability and degradations, uh, there are also prohibitions and restrictions on bathing. This was particularly true when they would be put into solitary confinement. There was disciplinary control that regulated actions such as excretion and, and urination. So there was a complete lack of privacy and a sense of vulnerability and exposure on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, often uh, there's the, their sleep mats. Um, and the conditions in which they had uh, they had to live uh, were infested with ants and bed bugs, sometimes swarms of maggots. Um, so the political prisoners in Nanjing were made to feel insignificant, frail, um, and non-human um, in countless ways inside the prison, all associated with this white uniform that they were also forced to wear. So really, at heart. To become a Nanjin, to become a political prisoner in Burma, was to really surrender to precarity. Uh, what Judith Butler would have called this sort of common corporeal vulnerability uh, shared by all humans. Um, 
And after moving through the torture chambers and the prisons, after experiencing these multiple forms of bodily degradations and dehumanization and violence in the prisons, it's understandable uh, that the Nanjin's ritual life and the technologies of the self that they employed were centered around increasing at least in a subjective way and in a symbolic way, not in an actual way because they were nonviolent protesters, but increasing their subjective sense of what I'll call ontological security, right? their sense of safety. Um, like sacred amulets, tattoos, and monastic robes, which I've talked about, um, the white shirts of the 88 generation can be conceptualized as a defensive psychological and physical barrier that gave rise to this feeling of safety, this feeling of ontological security uh, through practices of physically placing in the same manner, material layers on the body. And like sacred amulets, the white shirts are also an example um, of what Tambaya spoke about of how power and charisma can be sedimented in material objects. Um, so this is one of uh, my main um, ethnographic participants, really my friend, uh, one of the main leaders, or he's a Gaonzhou um, of the 88th generation Peace and Open Society. He was also a former political prisoner who was in prison for 20 years. Um, and he was also very briefly, actually not so briefly, for five years, a member of parliament um, under, in the um, NLD government. Um, so this is him in a person-centered interview I conducted with him talking about uh, the white shirts. Um, he says the white color signifies that the work I'm doing is noble and righteous. Um, other people with similar mindset also wear this color and I stand by what I do. Our way of dress is a way of demonstrating that we accept and that we are of one flesh. This is how I feel about it. And then he goes on, he says, um, the uniforms we wore were different in the past, but we put those differences aside when we formed the 88 generation. Um, the 88 generation, by, for those of you who don't know, by the way, is probably uh, the most significant and powerful. Uh, um, you know, they've largely disbanded now, and they've gone their separate ways. And if you caught the New York Times, um, you probably saw it on the New York Times and in the, in the general press, uh, Go Jimmy, who was executed by the junta um, was, uh, was a, one of the main leaders of the 88 generation, a comrade of Pyeongchul's, one of his, his closest friends. Um, so he says, we wore this uniform because we all stood for what we all stood for and represented one voice. We, represent, uh, we began representing this organization from the moment we put on this uniform including the rules of this organization, be it the rules of the revolution or the student organization. And when he says rules, he means more sort of ethical conduct like the law. We delivered a message to the public. So everyone wore the uniform at that particular press conference. He's talking about sort of the moment where they all came out dressed in white for a very particular press conference he had in 2012. We were now the same, despite our different backgrounds. We showed the public that we represented and we were one flesh. So he uses that word one flesh again. And then he, he goes on, this is a, a, a fairly long quote, uh, but at the end of it, he says, they, um, they also think that it represents the organization. He's talking about others who are not, can't be present with them during the quiz. Uh, the white shirt also means that we are obligated to follow an ethical code of conduct in, in, in addition to representing the organization. That's how I understand it. So Pyeongchul really conveys, if you read the rest of the transcript, which I can make available to you, um, Pyeongchul conveys a, this really strong subjective sense of being part of the, the, the same body, right? He describes it as being of one flesh. Um, so really the new self that's con constructed and created uh, when donning the white shirts is one where many vulnerable cells. So you'll recall how vulnerable they were in the torture chambers and in the prisons. It's how many vulnerable cells become fused into a stronger collective body. And that's one of the ways uh, that they're able to produce this sense of inviolability. It's true during the demonstration and the protest when they all go out with their white shirts and, uh, and true during these political festivals, Nanyangi Boys, when they all stand together like this. And during very key moments, 
when he's wearing the white shirt, particularly as a leader, a gaunzhan in public. Uh, Pyeongchou's body is transformed from former political prisoner uh, to the idealized form of the Duyega, the hero. Um, so for Pyeongchou, very clearly, uh, the white shirt also signifies righteousness, purity, um, and a life devoted to self-sacrifice. And the part about righteousness and purity is incredibly important because in the prisons, it was not just physical violence that they suffered, they also suffered epistemic violence where the authorities would repeatedly deny uh, that they were political prisoners. They would just call them common criminals, right? And this is one of the reasons they started calling themselves Mainji and this was a way to, and, and if they would call themselves political prisoners, they would be placed in solitary confinement or punished. So there was a, a, an attempt by the military government to sort of completely erase the history of the democracy movement and political imprisonment. Um, and so it would make them feel stronger to actually utter this colloquial term, Nanjin, over and over again. So this part about righteousness and purity is incredibly important to them and the other political prisoners. Um, and finally, um, you know, and we can talk more about it in the question and answer. I don't have time to elaborate on it here. Uh, but the Nanga Yebwe, these political f uh, festivals, are also significant because they're, as I've described, is very diffuse conceptual space uh, where Buddhists and non-Buddhists can gather. Uh, the term one flesh signals also the creation of new cells that transcend the constructed barriers of religious identity. Uh, the Nangai where it creates roles and selves that allow both Buddhists and non-Buddhists to be rendered pure and righteous and to stand together as a collective body that signifies one flesh. So purity and righteousness is no longer about religious affiliation or identity. It's whether or not you've gone through the sacrificial rite of imprisonment and torture and violence political violence. So uh, the, the uh, so Go Jimmy was executed, by the way, is, is, is standing to the far end. Uh, the person in the middle, also my friend, uh, and one of Pyeongchou's best friends, uh, Go Mia is standing in the middle. He's, he's actually from a Shia Muslim family, uh, also a very revered leader in the ADA generation. Um, and um, they're present, and as, as, I, as I've described in terms of the activists, really quite a range. Um, of, in terms of both secular beliefs, uh, but also religious identity affiliation, the families that they happen to come from. So going back to this question uh, that I posed um, in the very beginning, how are technologies um, of the self crafted um, in the Burmese context? You know, it's, it's, there's no easy answer and it's obviously very complex. Uh, certainly one core narrative of the social movement community is one where selflessness and sacrificial action are set up um, as a primary goal, as a motivation, uh, as a primary motivation and as an aspiration. Um, but around this core, um, and in the article, I, I use the term sort of the, the, the idea of the mandala to describe this, right? Around this core, are concentric circles with multiple narratives, multiple overlapping narratives, uh, where the self is also valorized as heroic, is considered to have sacred qualities, is potentially infused with power, is certainly worthy of protection, and also sometimes is worthy of adulation as a charismatic leader. Um, and you remember this question too, so how do social movements remain resilient? Um, well, certainly, um, through the sources of charisma, including the sedimentation of power in material objects as ex expressed in things like bodily adornment and other ritual objects, um, and also through sources of well-being, including an advent of mundane practices around dress, comportment, affect, and other ritual practices um, that enable new forms of self-making and world-making. Um, and, and I'm almost at time, so I wanna leave um, time for um, you know, a discussion and question and answers. But um, I don't know if for, for those of you who are Burmaphiles and file, uh, uh, you know, follow any of the things that happened during the coup or um, in its aftermath. But um, so um, about a year ago, Komia A, so this is, this is my friend, uh, this guy, uh, he was the only member of the 88 generation who was initially uh, 
arrested right away, right after the coup, because he happened to be home when the soldiers came. There's a long, long backstory to that. But anyways, he, he kind of like uh, disappeared, was in, imprisoned for almost two years, I believe. Um, and then he was um, released. And this was the, the day of his release when he's being brought from insane prison and stepping out of the, um, the bus to a, um, a, to a crowd of supporters. Um, him hugging his friend, um, and you know I was teaching my political imprisonment class uh, at UCLA, and um, you know and I brought this footage and I said you know so I make them you know, read these articles about white shirts and they have to write like essays on it and like discuss discussions and I was like oh look yeah there's there's look look he's, he's leaving the prison look how well groomed this man is look how pressed and nice uh, this white shirt is right. Uh, this is this is sort of you know a technology of self. This is sort of you can't underestimate the amount of bodily discipline that goes into this after two years in a Burmese prison. Um, so this is Sean Turnell, who actually just came out with this book. I hate to give him a hard time, although I don't know him in prison. He's like a very nice guy. He also was arrested around the same time that Komia A was arrested. Two years in the same Burmese prison. This is how he looked the day he came out of prison. So cannot underestimate how difficult it is that that type of bodily discipline and what goes into it. But they make they, they make it seem like uh, what they're doing is nothing, but it's it's really not the case. Um, so thank you. And I have more like I'll show you one more thing that's kind of fun. <laughs> so you'll notice also since the coup, uh, the generals men online. They're wearing a lot of these white shirts and they didn't used to do that. They always used to be in military uniforms, right? And he also just anointed or, or whatever did this huge opening and built this huge pagoda with this huge white Buddha, right? So fascinating. And and I might be wrong about this. So the Burmese here who, who, who know and can confirm this, I'm pretty sure he's wearing female garments, female mm -hmm. lounge. Right, which they've done before in the past too. So there's very famous photos of Feng Shui and Ding Xin and these former generals, Kim Yun, uh, wearing uh, female longi. So this is the chick to me, or the, um, you know, the, the chick pattern. Um, and it's usually, and his assistant is wearing it too. Um, it's typically, right? It's for women? I'm not sure. Is there, yeah, it, 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 it's right. So they they so they're also engaging in this sort of it's called yet and ache. It's like they're engaging in this symbolic reversal. I think this the lower garment is to sort of undo Aung San Suu Kyi's power, and I imagine the upper garment um, is to undo uh, the ADA generation or Mingbo Nine's power uh, and, and Kyoto's power, I guess too. Um, so yeah, so that's 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 it. <laughs> Well, thank you for a fantastic talk. We have plenty of time for Q&A in the room. And also those of you on Zoom, you can also um, raise your, use your hand, raise your hand function on Zoom if you'd like to chime in and we'll bring you into the queue. How many of these uh, white shirts, as far as you know, this 88 generation are now involved with the NUG? Do you know? They are. So, so, so you mean the, the actual people, right? Not the yeah, the actual, actual people. Yeah. No, no, the actual people. <laughs> um, so, so the many, many, many yeah. are, as I, as I said, um, Go Jimmy uh, was just, um, was just executed. He was hung. In um, exile? Are they in exile or in the, in the jungles? Yeah. Or? You know, if, if I, if, if I knew, I, I, I don't tell. Um, and I don't talk about it just because, um, you know, their safety is at risk. Uh, but so this, this also Zia Thaw right here, who's also wearing the white shirt, he's actually belongs to uh, not the ADA generation, but an a organization, activist organization called Generation Wave. He started that with Mingo Nine's encouragement. Uh, he was also a member of parliament, was also, as I said, just executed. Uh, so he, he, you know, he was involved with it, Jimmy was involved with it. Minko Nine is really fascinating, and, and I'm surprised that there's not more written about him, but right now he doesn't have, um, he doesn't have an official status in the NUG in terms of like a minister. He never ran for parliament because, you know, it's all part of the sort of the, 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 the life of sort of selfless action, right? But he's this amazing, 
uh, sort of moral center and authority and, and has, you know, like, like, like millions of followers as like a main advisor of the, the NUG, but just has his kind of separate status where he's not involved in, um, I don't know what you would call it, like political worldly affairs yeah. of the NUG, which, which com compromises you. And he, he doesn't get involved with finance and, you know, the NUG is also <clears throat> in its own way because of this part. Now the, the violent, I mean, the nonviolent movement um, has a question to do to armed struggle, as most of you know. And one thing about war and armed struggle is that nonviolent was the nonviolence was kind of like inexpensive and free. Uh, you know, war is really expensive, so they're raising like major money. It's like the big neoliberal term, I think, for the, for the democracy movement um, and the NUG. Um, and so, I and I doesn't really get involved with much of that apart from like donating his art and whatnot. So yeah, they're involved with it. There's a lot of continuity. Continuity between NLD and NBA generation, and as you call it, the white shirts uh, with this new government. Um, it's really interesting to hear how fashion influences politics and society. But uh, like you talk about symbolic meaning and meaning behind the white shirts. How about Longji and Tamil, like which are rooted in like tradition, ethnicities, and if one if a lot of politicians prioritize over Wayne Longji, how can Unite, how can we unite as a whole? Like, how can why, why don't like politicians wear modernized clothes instead of like wearing traditional clothing? Yes. You're talking about wearing uh traditional attire versus like pants or yeah. more westernized yeah. clothing, yeah. Um, you know, I, I don't I don't have, have a good answer for that, you know, in terms of I don't know if it's necessary. I mean, like, but I just came back from Indonesia and the fatigue shirt. I always thought that maybe like if the transition had gone through in Burma, like the basso or the male version of Hologi would become like the batik shirt and people would just like, you know, I'd go to a wedding and I'd like show up in batik, you know, it would be something like that. So I think there's sort of these, these hybrids uh, that are developed. Uh, one thing is I did talk about uh, the, um, the, um, the, the sort of the, the logis of the 88 generation where um, it's more apparent. It's a little bit more apparent here. Um, so the type that uh, he's wearing it and he's also wearing it. Um, the type of, uh, there was uh, in that interview that I did with Pyeongcho, he was actually talking about the moment where they had decided not only to wear white shirts, but combine them with a very particular type of loji, which is the yaw loji in this sort of dark brown black color, right? And then in the, if you read the paper in Ethos, I talk about that as well. And Piojo talks a lot about that, about it. And this is their way of really, uh, you know, I do it to sort of demonstrate sort of the assertion of political agency on his part. You know, this sort of very mundane thing that they deliberated a long time on, and they were all going to come out wearing these exact same mm -hmm. same outfits. And, and the Yalongi also has has a number of meanings. You know, both the white shirts and the Yalongis are really easily accessible. They're inexpensive. You can buy it at any marketplace. Uh, the Yalongi actually um, is a sort of very particular region of, of Burma, uh, but um, it, as I said, it's inexpensive. It comes in many colors, but they really picked these darker colors that are actually associated with funerary workers um, and, um, you know, uh, yogi, people who, who, who devote their lives to, to meditation, right? And was that conscious or subconscious on their part? It's, that's when it gets a little, uh, you know, more difficult to say, but certainly uh, there is a, a theme of nearness to death um, and liminality. Uh, in their in their symbolic attire, I don't know if that answers your question at all. Mm -hmm. yeah, I have a, a question. So, um, I'm curious if you can speak a little bit to, I guess maybe the broader valences of the white shirt, if you think that's relevant. So, like when I was doing my research, a lot of village headmen would wear these white shirts regardless of their kind of political persuasion. I also know during the campaign, USDP wore them as well. So mm -hmm. I'm curious, like, <laughs> and that's before the coup, right? So um, sometimes they're just worn in like political meetings. So I I'm just a little bit curious, do you think like, would you say that um, it's a kind of elite status marker that the 88 generation has kind of taken and carved out its 
what it represents in a particular way in a particular space in the ways that they wear it but it has this kind of like outside space or would you say it came through the 88 generation first and now has been picked up like as a more elite signifier broadly I guess I'm just curious because for me even though I'm super familiar with these white shirts I would never immediately be like oh that's an 88 generation thing just because I've seen them in so many other places and so many other contexts in fact I was trying to think back while you were talking, I was like, where did I first become familiar with it? And I think it's from like literature right after the colonial period when this was seen as like a, a way of kind of taking the like collared shirt of the white, you know, colonial officials and have a, a, a variation on it, which is sort of what you're speaking to, but, um, but wasn't necessarily tied directly to um, only the, the independence movement but more of a kind of elite like play on on western dress in general so anyway i'm just i was just reflecting on my own my own sense of the white shirts and i'm curious if you think that's grown out of 88 or 88 is a version of that so so, so everything that i trace like from like the pre-buddhist period to you know so it's something it's it's sort of these layers of interpretive meaning uh that you can attribute to the to their donning of the white shirt and they certainly sort of recreated it um, as their own, but one of the main reasons, I kind of take issue with the use of the word elite, because these white shirts, as I said, are inexpensive and are like readily available, um, and they're worn not just by elites, uh, but at weddings. Usually, it's, I mean, it's a ceremonial attire. That's probably why you see the village headman, and it, it, you know, it, it does have an association with charisma and power. Um, and so that, and you know, even think that like images, uh, you know, like images of like Buxa, which are like wizards, you know, in, in sort of Buddhist sort of text and, and sort of pictorial sort of murals and what are, they're often wearing like white with like a white turban and whatnot. Um, so it's it associated with sort of liminality, power, charisma. Um, and so they're taking uh, some of this on, uh, you know, in the ceremonial sort of attire, the ritual attire, the protest attire that they choose. But one of um, one of the most ingenious aspects of it actually is that it really also made it so that the junta, because it was very easy for the junta to say, okay, you're wearing a red NLD t-shirt, you have an NLD logo, you got a big picture of Aung San Suu Kyi on you. Uh, it was very easy for them to go and physically harass those people and imprison them just for wearing the t-shirt. Not the case with the white shirt, which as you said, is worn in other contexts as well. Um, in relation to sort of the USDP and the USDA, uh, they did it after 2012, and that was when most of us had the most access to Burma and spent the most time there. I don't know if they did it before 2012 it's as much in meetings. When they took off the military uniform, that was the yeah, option, sure. I guess, right? So, or what time the USDA was civilian, always. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. a civilian wing of it, and I think they just wore what, whatever white mm -hmm. shirts look good, and it could have been like plaid or like, you know, um, so um, so I, I don't know that that would have been true after 2012, but it would be interesting. Um, and now, of course, men online, and, and they seem to be wearing it quite a lot, the color white. Um, so I don't know if that... Yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah. Can I ask one other, like, small related follow, which is just, like, um, the kind of gender dimension of the white shirt? Like, there's a variation <laughs> that's for women, but the kind of, like, prototypical one that I'm familiar with is this one. Is that, um, do you see the same logics applying to the kind of woman one that looks a little bit different and has a slightly different they, they, they wear too it's called the yin zi Amy. they usually wear a white version of that um in the if you read the article as well i actually talk about how uh, some of the female dissidents especially neil Thane, who was actually uh go jimmy's uh spouse uh talked about how when they were in prison they also had white prison uniforms at the time and then when they would um bathe at the you know communal bathing area the, the white uniforms made them feel that much more exposed and vulnerable because they would be transparent and then there would be guards and also um, you know convicted rapists looking over the wall and peering and jeering at them. Uh, so it, it was certainly part of their their sense of both exposed. It had these layers of meaning for them as well. He raised his hand first. Um, I come from uh, another department, uh, but, but, but uh, from Eastern uh, European studies, and uh, but I I'm just fascinated how uh, how one on one basically the experiences are between the Burmese uh, resistance and uh, the let's say resistance of the Baltic states against the Soviet Union. Uh, in you know 
at, at the human level, uh, it's it's fascinating. Um, the the identity of victimhood of having suffered of of this uh, self uh, self uh, elevation through suffering and through embracing how you nicely put surrendering to precarity. Uh, I think that's very important. But uh, what uh, what I've seen from from my own uh, case, uh, there are efforts to subvert that uh, by by the regime possibly and as as you showed but also by uh you know of course uh, nowadays the, the the those times have uh, a temporal distance so so by uh, a, a, agents uh, who seek to speak for the name of the white shirt of the charismatic sacred authority uh and so i was wondering if there's any any appearances of that type of subversion in, in, in Burma. Uh, and just a quick follow-up, which is related. You mentioned tattoos and an increasing amount of tattoos. D does the suffering physical pain element, uh, you know, is it somehow emphasized as, a, as a, you know, a mimetic sort of mechanism to repeat the, 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 uh, the pain that it takes you to actually wear the white shirt? Uh, that's so fascinating. Especially your second question is really fascinating. And in, in terms of, I, I know you didn't ask this, but I, um, I actually, I, I um, you know, over over the summer, I attended this workshop in Leiden, and this was um, the one of the first opportunities I've had to really compare, uh, you know, trauma um, in in different parts of Europe, both Eastern um, and Central and West, and also Western Europe, like in the aftermath of World War II, for example, in relation to the Holocaust, um, and as a Southeast Asianist be able to have discourse with uh, academics and historians who actually who studied trauma from a very different generation through archives and whatnot. And it was fascinating, the human similarities uh, that existed. And I also teach a class on political imprisonment uh, at UCLA. And once again, just like across the Black Panthers, across, you know, the Northern Irish, the Palestinians, how much uh, there is, you know, there, there's there's these commonalities across in relation to your um, your question about. I think your question, from what I understand, is whether or not the authorities, the military, has attempted to uh, sort of usurp sort of the meaning of the white shirt. It seems like that's what they're sort of clumsily trying to do in these like that's sort of the sense I get from the big white Buddha. I didn't I didn't bring a picture of the big white Buddha, but he has this big white Buddha that he just he just uh, donated that's connected to this you know large uh, temple, this pagoda, and he seems to always be wearing white shirts these days when he's you know being photographed. So there's some sense of it. He's he's certainly trying to pull in some of that spiritual potency or that power power signify somehow the purity, right, and the righteousness um, and the symbolism of the ADA generation. I don't know how successful uh, they've been at it. Uh, it, it less, as I said, it seems comical and clumsy to me, uh, you know, but obviously, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at it through a very particular lens. I don't know how it plays out with the rest of the, the people in Burma. I, I don't imagine that it plays out very well, given all the different meetings that, that have been gen generated about that as well um, on, on Burmese Facebook. Um, and your other question uh, was about the sort of the, yes, the tattoos and the pain. Uh, it's fast. I, I haven't thought of it along those lines before. That, it, that, that is very interesting. You don't, a lot, a lot of the political prisoners, unless they come from, uh, especially some of the urban students, aren't necessarily going to be tattooed. But there's a sense, there is this very interesting association, obviously, between sort of bodily pain, um, you know, and and this, you know, you know, sort of um, purity and spiritual potency arising and being somehow connected to that. I haven't really quite been able to sort of pull it all together. That's really fascinating. Yes, um, since I can't think a little bit, if you have already discussed, then we can see more questions. Um, can we reconcile is the white color and then the um the suffering uh resolution movement in 2007 like that is orange color right uh that represents the buddhist monk representation right and this could if we go back to the student movement back in 1988 uh because in Myanmar you always wear this white shirt as a student i have been wearing even this morning i almost 
Wait, but my wife said, no, don't wait. You can only wear one to teach because for us that has related to our like education, school, and white shirt is good meaning, right? So is there any way we can make uh, connections between this white and then the, the Buddhist monk suffering like orange color? So I feel like seven movement. Is there any meaning between these two? Yeah, so, so as I said, so before there, there's, so one, one, one connection um, is that before uh, they don the saffron robe, uh, there for, for, for a, um, you know, for a brief period, sometimes it's just a couple hours, but sometimes it can go on for a couple of years if they're never, uh, if they never are actually uh, novitiated or as monks, uh, they wear white, uh, something called poking dolls. They wear white. Right, and then I have interviews actually with Kelcho where he's kind of in. When I first started interviewing him in like 2013, referencing, he said, "Oh, you know, I, I you know, I went, um, you know, I, I was in prison, and then they gave me these two, you know, this white uniform, like uh, like poke dolls, right?" And so he had a very strong association. It's the same sort of. It's it's you know, it's what's happening to him in the prison environment was happening in sort of the same kind of symbolic um, and ritual landscape as as you know um you know what's carried out in buddhism this robing and disrobing the white uh, robes and the saffron robes uh so there is this this sort of connection um in terms of the monastic order and activism um and them sort of really taking uh these different um ceremonial attires and, and different leaders uh, in the same way that the 88 generation did uh what i found at least uh during my my field work um, is that um, a lot of the, it, it seemed that the military was much more successful at suppressing uh, the monastic order after the Saffron Revolution. And there, there were, uh, you know, uh, individuals that I interviewed who were monks, who were former political prisoners, but generally the monks, really mem members of the monastic order, did fare as well. Um, as the urban student activists. They didn't have the same type of social support. A lot of the, you know, to begin with, a lot of individuals who go into the monastic order in Burma are usually from very poor rural villages, from families who typically can't afford to keep them as children. And so they send them they, into the, uh, the monasteries when they're young to become monks. So they often didn't survive their, the prisons uh, at all. Um, and sometimes there would be no uh, family even to sort of notify of their death. Um, after they came out, they didn't, um, you know, if they went back into the monastic order, um, it didn't really feel like they were, they really came out as sort of these potent sort of political forces in terms of the leadership. Uh, they were just much more, I mean, I, I think just over the, the many decades, and this reaches far back, not even before 1988, they went. Um, that for a variety of reasons, um, really you had, um, I, th I think it was just a much more, uh, there were really no uh, monastic leadership on the activist front anymore, that they had very successfully uh, kind of um, dominated um, the monastic order. And those who were former political prisoners and who were also monks, there are some Sia dolls or senior abbots who were, um, activists um, and the ADA generation would ha um, have ways where they would go and donate robes to them and whatnot. But it, my, my impression was that um, they were, um, they, they were, they were in, in, in a lot of ways, they were working without the, the sort of charismatic uh, sort of support and leadership that folks like the ADA generation were working with. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. Thanks, thanks for this talk. One thing that I really like about what you do is that you break the symbolic meaning and the possibilities into all these different levels, right? So sometimes something can converge and you can have different actors who use the same thing, but the, the actual actor who's using it may combine all those different meanings in different ways. And so that might be a way to help explain how sometimes you might have the use of the same symbol in a different context, but in another context, it can mean a like all of those meanings kind of align mm -hmm. in particular contexts, right? And so um, one thing I just want, this is a comment, not a question, but that I'll follow the question. It made me think a little bit of this article by O'Brien and a book later about, called Rightful Resistance. Mm -hmm. And there's something about the way in which this evokes with the school context, the formality, all of these, it evokes like the idea of sort of 
this is a rational, rightful resistance to wrong-headed behavior. But the, the flip side of that too is how the junta also has all this, you know, rule, not rule of law, but rule by law, you know, like they, they constantly talk about law and order, all of these kind of like historically. So they're actually in some sense, you could make the argument, like I think some people are saying, is they're playing with that symbolism mm -hmm. because they know that it's associated with this formality and right as a as a ruse to sort of say, we're not just a junta, but we're like the defenders of rule of law mm -hmm. in this perverted kind of way, right? Yeah. Um, so I guess my question on that, so that's the comment part, but I guess my question is how do people know when it's being worn wrong? You know, like in fashion, you could tell when somebody's wearing something they shouldn't be wearing, mm -hmm. right? And people talk about it mm -hmm. and they snicker or they you know, say negative things about that person. There's also cultural appropriation in the US right now. That's a you know big problem and people will recognize who should wear and who shouldn't wear something. So are there variations of that in contemporary Burma, Myanmar, where uh, people are calling out in a way, your talk is kind of doing that to the general. It ends by calling them out by misusing it. But are there ways in which in everyday life people do that? They say, this person shouldn't be wearing this thing. Um, you know, th there is there is a, a, a you know, sort of a, a discourse in the in the um, sort of a prisoner and activist community about sort of authenticity, right? Mm -hmm. And authenticity, and usually authenticity for them is very clear. It's, 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 it's has that person uh, gone through the the sacrificial rite of the prison? Have, have they experienced political violence? Move through this sequence, um, and they have a particular you know, sequence that it's, it's you know it's not it's sufficient for them to be just interrogated for a couple of days. They really have to be sentenced, and they have to. Um, so um, it's not it's you know it's not called out just for Donnie White or not. I think it's it's more sort of sort of who you are. Typically, when you show up to these uh, political festivals, sometimes. Um, individuals might wear white out of solidarity with the movement, or there might be white shirts that the activists themselves have sort of uh, created for that occasion. You can have that on, but really the legadone, the Mandarin color, the legadone, uh, a pew legadone Amy, the white shirts, but the Amy gender sheet, it's kind of understood that like it's what the political, former political prisoners wear. And if you've gone through the sacrificial rite of imprisonment, um, you know, it has this deep meaning, but no one, I've never like, seen, you know, like take, you know, I used to, I, I remember like, like at the Berkeley Stanford game, uh, you know, if if someone's wearing like uh, the Stanford colors on the Berkeley side, they're like, take off that red. <laughs> <laughs> they don't do that. <laughs> um, and um, and then your your point about um, you know, in terms of uh, the generals using uh, the symbols really of the democracy movement to gain legitimacy uh, is really is really fascinating. Um, and the question, of course, is okay. So they're they're using this these symbols in this sort of shallow, uh, kind of empty way. How do people know otherwise, right? Um, and are are certain people fooled, or does it confer them with, you know? So is the king always just the person that's like really highest up, and you know, is gilded with gold, and you know, you know? So um, I think I, mean, I think of Trump, you know. But I mean, like, so you know, you you wonder how people are processing it, but yeah, it's a really great comment. If we could take okay. two more questions. Yeah, actually, I think his hand's been up for a while, so I'll let yeah. go. Sorry, uh, I have a question that is a little bit beyond your uh, presentation, but uh, which you hinted at at the start, which, which you said was you're writing a book on the uh, democracy movement. Um, and I was wondering, and you hinted at the start, that, you know, uh, look at the 2015 uh, landslide elections uh, as a kind of combination of that movement. Uh, and so I'm curious, uh, after the 2015 election, uh, I understand a lot of these uh, democracy movement activities, they got into government, uh, but some of them, I guess, were also not part of the government. Mm -hmm. So would you be able to shed some light on uh, when they went in government, uh, what were they doing? Were they lobbying for certain things? And for those who are outside of the government, uh, what were they doing as well? Were they um, engaging in more of these uh, political festivals or were they lobbying the government for some kind of policies? Yeah, it's a really, really good question, actually. Um, so, um, yeah, so there's a set of people who ended up going into the administration, even within the 88 generation. Uh, this was a huge thing because Pyeongchang 
uh, was the only person that the NLD selected out of everyone in the ADA generation, including very uh, you know charismatic figures like Gogo G, um, Jimmy and Mingo Nine did run, but also Gomia A, uh, you know, and they selected only one person, uh, and this was a huge, huge uh, sort of emotional blow uh, to people in the ADA generation. I was there when when um, you know it happened. You know, so um, so one of the so I'm actually writing a chapter now for an edited volume on uh, memory, um, and part of the you know the question that I ask is why um, you know um, the 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 memory, the historical memory of of this deep suffering that the, that political prisoners went went through, and political communities in Burma went through in the prisons of 1988, for example, uh, was never. Uh, securitized by the NLD. Uh, so yes, the, the political festivals, so the, the people who weren't, who didn't end up joining the government were still hanging out with Yangon. I actually spent most of my time with them. They would still hold these commemorations. You know, when I say though, there's like a, you know, like two to a dozen commemorations and poems per week, they were still continuing to hold it between 2015 and 2020. Uh, you know, they never really needed a whole lot to be able to hold it. Everyone volunteered, got, food that was donated, very small amount of money, but every year they would scramble uh, to uh, organize the big festival for to memorialize the 88 protests, for example. I even got involved and was like on a couple of committees a couple of years, you know, to help help raise funds and whatnot. Um, and um, you know, and it's 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 a really that's what I deal with in this chapter. It's a really fascinating question. So why you know why didn't the NLD declare August eighth, nineteen eighty eight, a national holiday? They could have if the NLD had wanted to, they could have brought a former political prisoner or one of their family members uh, on stage every day of their administration and had them give testimony about the suffering you know that they they went through. They had over a hundred elected just just in parliament, not including the ministries, not including all the NLD volunteers who had, you know, over a hundred, I think it was something like a, over 120 members, 140 members of parliament were former political prisoners. They could have really, uh, you know, done these very elaborate ceremonies, right? And practices, why didn't they take like, you know, this very, in addition to wearing the white shirts, they do the ceremony where they do the alapu, which is when they honor the sacrifice of the prisoners that a lot of the, these NLD members of parliament would join uh, these festivals, but it was always kept at this local level, um, only on Martyrs Day, the whole day, the, the whole nation state would do the LDP. You know, why didn't they, you know, I mean, they could have brought, it, and some of these people are like incredibly charismatic, like Pyeong Cho and, you know, Ming, I mean, they could have brought, you know, them on stage every day and have them do charismatic oratory around the memory of their suffering to securitize their position. And they didn't do that. So this is part of what I mean. I don't have good answers for that. Um, I have some answers for that. I think part of it was the selflessness, the sacrifice. They couldn't really, uh, you know, they never really, um, you know, wanted to be mnemonic actors who were going to use the memory of their suffering in an instrumental way to hold on to power. I think that was part of it. Um, I think another part of it was that they already had, per the tenets of sacrifice and sacrificial action, uh, they had so much legitimacy already. I mean, even despite the military's attempts to really suppress this memory, the fact of the matter is everyone knew and the electorate knew, and it was obvious from the landslide victories that they were the party that had had this tremendous suffering. They were the party that had, you know, political prisoners who went in for 10, 20 years uh, to sacrifice on behalf of the nation state. So another reason maybe that they didn't really have to engage in this sort of additional uh, form of legitimacy. But I have a much longer to write that that's the, the short answer for now. This is more of a comment or a reflection. So I would like um, to reflect on the white shirts in the context of the current, the ongoing revolution. And I wonder if they have not become more a vestige of the 88 generation struggle and actually even symbolize the generational divide because what makes the ongoing revolution or what's so characteristic for the ongoing revolution is actually the liberation of this young generation, the, the Gen Z 
uh, from the need for a charismatic leader, for example, as well as from all of these uh, traditional values that have been restricting them, including Buddhism, especially with its emphasis on acceptance and karma. Right? Um, but also, if you look at how the young generation uh, of the Yebo, as they call, they call themselves, rather than Nanjin, as they dress, right, the emphasis on black, or uh, the fact that they're not cutting their hair, right? So many of them have decided they will not cut their hair until they win the revolution. So it's almost the reversal, right, of this restrictions that they have grown up with or these teachings from their parents, from society, from religious teachers, the military, so on and so on. Yeah, so Yebwa just means comrade, right? And they used it as well. They called each other, the age of generation, they called each other Yebwa. But revolutionary also, right? Yeah, yeah, so absolutely. So, so no, it's a great question. Um, you know, I noticed that in the media coverage and even in, in a lot of the early academic writings on sort of the, the they call the spring revolution on the sort of the 2021, you know, the, you know, the, you know, the sort of the, the social movement that, that arose after the 2021 coup. I think you see both discontinuity and continuity, I would say. And I think there's a tendency in the writings and the representations to emphasize as we do, which is also a bias that we have in this culture to emphasize, you know, generational differences, the generation gap and, uh, you know, the, the younger generation. And there's, you know, there, there's a, you know, Gen Z, um, I think there's ways that they're transforming and innovating and producing new forms of resistance in the same way that 88, the 88 generation did and continues to do. Uh, some of it may be, you know, I don't know the, the thing about growing their hair long, for example. Um, but I think there's also quite a lot of continuity, continuity in sort of social networks, uh, even in the actual families and communities uh, that actually participate in the resistance movement. Um, and this was true also in 1988. They also were the new generation, were the 88 generation, but actually they had uncles. When, when I actually sat down an interview with them, they had uncles and aunts who went through the Uthat movement in the 1970s and who were political prisoners. Uh, they had individuals who reached, you know, grandparents who, you know, who were participating in the colonial era resistance. So I think you can, you can, you know, and it's fun. It's fun to, to point out all the new ways, you know, that they're engaging in. Uh, sort of uh, and producing and creating new forms of resistance, new rituals around it. And I think a lot of, um, you know, what's going to be really interesting is I think a lot of, I think it's exciting uh, that a lot of, uh, from what I understand, some scholars are still kind of on the ground there. And I think you can only really know what's going on uh, from an ethnographic perspective uh, by really being there. And I think it's, it's a little bit difficult with all the Facebook posts and pictures uh, from people outside of Burma to really know what the mundane practices of resistance are uh, in these villages. Um, I imagine they are still also still wearing amulets. I imagine, and there's, there's quite a lot of, there are photographic depictions of this coming out. They are engaging in a lot of tattoos. You know, and some of it is explicitly in the democracy. So, you know, the answer is there's both continuity and then, you know, new forms of innovation around resistance. So if I might just, <laughs> yeah. just add one on the, the amulets and the, and the tattoos. Well, actually, the young generation of activists, they have been making an emphasis on rejecting this, you know, focus, especially of the international community when they speak about politics in Myanmar, on this, you know, the supernatural end of this exotization right so they make an emphasis on connection on connection with with the outside world right and the tools um they have changed as well i think the tools are really uh interesting uh to look at and important and a lot of the young uh, resistance members, they are getting a lot of new tattoos, but they're not these uh, the, the same traditional Buddhist tattoos, right? They have um, those, those meanings. They're, they're quite different. Uh, yeah, that's fascinating. And once again, like the only thing I would caution is just like with the Arab Spring, where a large part of that took place online. And that was also when, you know, you had things called the Facebook revolution and the Twitter revolution, right? And, and you know, uh, you know, like somehow like Facebook and Twitter had, you know, created resistance and dissidents, you know, in, in Iran, 
right? Which, you know, which is absolutely ridiculous. So I would be a little careful about like, there's this is really interesting online component. And this, once again, the people who are able to communicate those types of things, uh, you know, especially in an online medium, um, it, it is a very small group of individuals from in, in, inside the country. So, so you know, I don't know. As an ethnographer, I would not know all these things I do about the ADA generation if I hadn't been there and with them, and they they were willing for whatever reason to accept me and let me observe all these things and hang out with them. I would not be able to report back on it. That's why I try to report back on it because it wasn't anything that you would have known really about or I would have known about. Right. And so I think to balance out, you know, the very vocal, I know there's a lot of very vocal activists who, you know, also give out interviews and, you know, and it's, 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 it's all great. It's all great stuff, you know, but you also want to really, and I'm also really curious about a lot of like these videos that do come out. Uh, Cause I'm not physically there right now. I'm not. Um, and, you know, there, there are a lot of things that come out with these like festivals that they're organizing and folk songs that they're engaging in and dances that they're doing that, I, that, that are just, you know, I want to know more about that. And so you can say that, you know, these young activists are characterized this way, they're against Buddhism, they're against whatever is it, the patriarchy or whatever it is, you don't really know until you're embedded in a village in Sakai that's engaging in resistance, like physically there, so. Well, we're, we're out of time. We have to give the room over, but yeah. I just want to thank you for a great talk. We'll continue this conversation over lunch. Thank you. Thank you. I read the book. We can follow up. They don't go country, they go they take hero by hero. I'm trying that now with a couple of courses I'm going to give down to Sarasota, but it's difficult to do. I assume the news is quite interesting. Yes, yeah, no, so 